Can everybody hear me okay? All right, perfect. So I am extremely cognizant that I am the last thing between you and whatever after uh, <laughs> session activities you're going to be doing. So hopefully I don't put you to sleep. Um, we always talk about be brief, be brilliant, be gone. I can only promise you two of those things. <laughs> you can figure out which ones are going to be. So my name is Paul Wagner. I'm with the University of Arizona. Please don't judge me. I understand I'm in Sun Devil country. Um, <laughs> But I really want to talk about a kind of a problem, and it's already been discussed a number of times today. So I like this winding road that's on here because that's a lot of people's pathway into cybersecurity, where they came from, how they got to this point, and what's going on. And ideally, when we talk to, I talk to my students, it's like, well, tell me the path. How do I get there? What do, what do I do? And it's like, yeah, it doesn't work that way. So my journey started in the Army. I, I grew up in the Midwest where it was farming, maybe a manufacturing company or college. And I wasn't a college person at that point. So when I joined, I got to about halfway through. I was getting ready to get out. Um, I was an infantry person, a recruiter. I had my master's degree. I'm like, ah, I'm going to rock it. Fortunately, it was 2008. Taking a $30,000 pay cut wasn't really in the cards for me. So I went to another country. And it worked out better than I could have possibly imagined. But that was humbling to go through and think that I was going to get that job, that I was going to do that thing. And it wasn't in tech, it was just getting out. I thought I had the credentials that I needed to be successful. So fast forward, I did learn something like infantry is probably not the most uh, versatile skill to kind of transition into the workforce. And I'm like, well, I need to do something tech. Um, so I became a communications officer. It was great, but I was a communications officer. I was a manager. So I had my soldiers that would look at me like, can you do this? I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. You speak this lingo. What do I need to do? Mm -hmm. So it was always this game of catch up to do what I needed to do to be able to figure out what were they talking about to lead them in the best way that I could. Um, transitioning towards the end, I was in an intelligence unit. And my journey into cyber kind of began with literally being cornered in a parking lot, which may sound very confusing. But I was offered an opportunity to take some free classes. Like, do you want to do this pen testing class? I'm like, Yes, yes I do. So I went over to this class, I'm walking out, and the director of the program uh, came up to me and said, I think you can teach. I'm like, okay. He's like, why are you standing so close to me? Can you please move back? And uh, it was dark, it was after hours, but it worked out great. So during that time, I got into cyber. I've done a lot of things to try to prepare myself, but it was a winding road. And that's where we kind of come into this. And I put this v CISO thing on there because it was another one of those opportunities Reached out on LinkedIn. I said, hey, do you think I can do this? And the guy's like, absolutely, you'll be fine. I'm like, that imposter syndrome kicking in. Why would somebody listen to me? Why does somebody want to uh, be involved in this? So when we're looking at this, it becomes of what the problem is. And we're really here for 500,000 plus positions domestically. They're open. 3.5 million positions globally. We'll talk about some of these other things that are listed here. But that's a problem. But it's also the marketing. So when my students come to me, it's like they try to do the math, and they're like, OK, so 500,000 jobs. If I apply, if I get this degree, you're going to give me a job, right? No, that doesn't work that way either. What are you going to do to set yourself for, for success? How are you going to take this stuff and do it? So real quick, this is on here, and I got a couple of slides. But just raise your hand. Is cybersecurity an entry level job? What are your thoughts? Yes, raise your hand. So there's two out of. So two out of 50 that think that this is an entry-level job. OK. So, but why isn't it? Why do we have entry-level positions that are listed out there? And what does that mean? So cyberseek.org says, you look at that left-hand side there, feeder role. It means that, no, cybersecurity isn't an entry-level role. You should have background in one of those things that then transitions into entry-level. But is, is that right, according to the uh, participants here, that's about right. That's probably a lot of people's journeys. They had some experience and some background that took them to that situation, and now they can kind of figure it out. But what does this do for the person like myself? I wasn't willing to take a $30,000 pay cut to get out of the Army in 2008. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't support my family. But what about people that are in this situation where they took a career path, that career path for whatever reason, COVID, it just the, the industry died. And they were making fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, and the answer to them is, well, "Good luck. You're going to be on the help desk for fifteen dollars an hour." 
it's not going to happen. So how do we create those barriers? We say that we can do this. This is an inclusive environment for us to do it. But is that the reality? And how do we make it a reality? So Indeed says that an entry-level job requires minimal education, training, and experience. So this 2019 study looked at 12,000 jobs. They scraped all of these websites, and the information that's on here is what they said. 60% needs a college degree. Required, not preferred, required. Well, OK, so that's, is that entry level? What are we talking about here? And then on the right, we see certifications. Another easy answer or question that I get from students is, what certification should I get first? It's like, OK, yes, yes, there's certifications. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But there, there isn't a right answer. There isn't this path, this magical way that I'm going to become the SOC analyst, the CISO, this whatever your job goals are. But there is some discrepancies. 2019 to where we're at, a CISSP requires five years of minimum experience in some kind of IT and management, but 5% of the jobs as an entry level require five years of experience, then why are we classifying it as that entry level position? So I pulled some job ads, and I was actually pretty pleased with this. So we've seen a reduction, well, at least in my brief analysis, of what are the key skills? What are the requirements? So on this slide here, you see degree not required. We would like some basic experience. Willing to seek CISSP. OK, well, that's another strange one. It's like no degree, no experience, nothing. But you need to go through this. After five years, what are, what are we doing? So a little bit of discrepancy there. So we're talking like, where is the miscommunication? Here's another one, qualifications, none. 8570, get your security plus, do something like that, and we're going to be able to have you work for the government. OK. Minimum requirements, one year. Internships, classes, projects. I like this. So not only do you not have to have that actual experience, but they're looking at what did I do outside of the traditional educational realm to be able to get some experience? And that's valuable. You may even learn more for that. So how do we look at that kind of stuff? Um, and then how do you express it is another thing that I think students struggle with, or anybody that's going into it. It doesn't have to be students. How do you articulate the skills that you spent whatever your lifetime is, whether it's you're 18, 20, or you're 60 trying to make this transition. How do you articulate? And here's another one. Experience. Hack the box. Try hack me. I've seen a lot of LinkedIn profiles. I'm top 5% and try hack me. I'm top 1% in this. That's a way for you to differentiate yourself in some way to be able to do the things that you're trying to do. OK, so what do I need? So I, again, I work with a lot of students. I try to be mentor um, to them. I work with an organization called vetsec.org, where they're trying to get um, individuals. No veteran that wants to get a security job should go without that kind of a job. They offer free training. They just got approved for a work study with SANS. Like, apply here, go here, 2500 bucks. It's interesting how many people took advantage of that opportunity. It was one. It's like, wait, what? I'll take it. What are we doing here? So do we need education? Here's kind of that big thing, the Spider-Man meme pointing at each other like, no, 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 you need this, you need this, you need this. You need education. OK, so let's go back to that raise of hands. Is education the most important piece for being a cybersecurity professional? Who thinks yes? OK, good. No hands are up here. Well, what about certifications? It's obviously certifications. If I am certified, if I'm CompTIA, I'm uh, ISC squared, that means I'm a cyber professional. Are certifications the best indicator of somebody's knowledge, skills, and ability? Anybody say yes? OK, again, no. OK, good. Experience. Is this the end all, be all? Is it all about the experience? If you have that experience, what does that mean? And I'm going to define this a little bit before I ask the question. Is experience solely defined by the job that you had? You must have been a SOC analyst. You must have been an IT specialist, a help desk operator. Is that the definition of experience that we're looking for? So if based on that definition, is that a yes? Is that the level of competency that we're looking for? No. OK, so we're looking to be more inclusive. But then there's the and. Well, I need to belong to a professional group. Do I? No. It's a means to an end. Skill development, capture the flags, coming to conferences, figuring out what's going on, building a computer, doing something above and beyond the structured curriculum that's there, and trying to be better at your craft. Networking, here's a big one, cornered in a parking lot. OK, that, I don't know if I would call that networking, but it, it worked out for me. OK, um, LinkedIn, reaching out to that connection to say, hey, what are your thoughts? That was networking. Why am I here today? Um, I actually just got a reminder from Sand saying that 
congratulations on Graham, this is your one year anniversary. So Ryan was my instructor for this. So I texted him, I'm like, hey man, I know we talked, appreciated your class. What are your thoughts about this as a topic for CactusCon? He's like, sure, let's do it. How's the sausage made? What are we gonna talk about? That was networking, figuring out who would give you the opportunity to do something like this. And then volunteering. So I look out here and I see one of our students who is volunteering. So I put in a Discord channel saying, hey, again, after talking to Ryan, we've done it for two years now, can I advertise volunteer jobs? It's like, yes, I, we need as many people as possible to help us out because it doesn't run itself. Mm -hmm. Those are the differentiations between what people have, that experience that we talked about, but you learn, you network, you bring all of these pieces together so that you can be that cyber professional, the most well-rounded person. So when you go and you fill out your resume, it's not that you have 10 years of experience, it's I am that person that is willing to do whatever it takes to be your best employee, but I need a chance. I will work for you. And you've demonstrated that. It can't be the, well, I promise I'm gonna work really hard when you hire me. It's like, no, 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 no. Put some skin in the game. What did you do to get here? So how do I get there? So I, I like backwards planning, okay? Maybe that's a military thing where it's like, I, need, I know I need to go take that hill to go do that thing. Well, okay, but what's our goal? It doesn't have to be like this huge mission where I'm gonna go invade another country and all that kind of stuff. Is it a degree? Is it a cert? Is it a job? It could be something as simple as a project. I wanna be able to write Hello World, okay? That is a step, and that can be very intimidating to some people. Like, I am not a computer science person. So when they're like, oh, you need to build this algorithm, I'm like, what is that? I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about, an algorithm. It sounds like this fancy thing that's gonna like rocket ships and things like that. Um, it reminds me of my first job as an officer was in Space Command. Before Space Force, there's still a Space Command. And there's rocket scientists and they're like, so you need to go talk to them about the orbital mechanics and the thrust to get the satellite and how long it's gonna be. I'm like, you lost me. So I'm like, hey, you're really smart at this. You're, you're gonna come to this meeting and I'm gonna look at you, I'm gonna pair at you, I'm gonna learn from you, but I'm gonna make sure that you are my champion so that we can do this. So you gotta have a goal. And then you need to do a self-assessment. I am very cognizant of my strengths and my weaknesses. But if you don't take that time to self-assess, you have no idea how to build your plan to get to where you need to go. So you need that goal, you need to bring it back. But I like SMART, okay? Because I see a lot of people like, first course that they ever took, I'm gonna go get Grem, um, or GX Pen, or whatever. I'm not a programmer, some reason I signed up for GX Pen, that did not work out really well in my favor. But it was a stretch. I knew it was gonna be um, a challenge for me to go through that. So what is that goal? Is it achievable? Saying, I'm gonna have a degree in two years and you've never taken a college class, maybe, but it's not really achievable. And is it timely? That, that's another thing that people forget is as they're going through this whole process that you gotta put a time limit on it. I, I'm a procrastinator. Like, I was having conversations with some people in this room and I'm like, yeah, my slides aren't done yet. I'm figuring out what's going on. I don't know what I wanna talk about. But here we are, slides are there, so we'll figure out how well this goes. I'll get some feedback after this. But it needs to be timely. If it wasn't for this conference, I wouldn't have put these slides together, I wouldn't have made this go through. So some other things, I'm not saying that education is the end all be all. It's one tool to be able to get to the goal that you have. And there's some standards, not all education institutions, not all programs in those institutions are created equally. But there's some things that you can look at to determine what's a better program than others. So the Center of Academic Excellence, CAE community, goes through and designates school based on a list of criteria. So the schools have to apply, so they actually took that initiative to do that. Again, not all created equally. But here's a starting point. So when we talk to people and like, how do I get into this industry? How do I go do these things? It's like, you need to do some research. You need to figure out what you want and where is the best place. There's some of these dots on this map that's a $60,000 investment or more, plus four years of your life. Is that the right path? I don't know. And then the certification. I love this slide because people are like, I need a certification. It's like, okay, maybe, 8570 working for the government, yes, that is a strict requirement for that. Well, which one? You look at the slide, it makes your head hurt. And these are some of the better ones. There's also some where, I, I was reading a book, it was on pen testing, it's like, I wrote this book, and then I wrote this certification, and for an extra $80 on top of this, you can also get this certification. I'm like, who are you? And does anybody even think this is realistic? 
there needs to be value. There needs to be a reason why you are getting the certification. But it's one piece of the problem because we hear in the news like, get certified, you will get employment. Take this boot camp and you will get employment. Okay, maybe. So what is being done? I mean, it's one thing to kind of pick these little pieces apart. That's kind of that triad, education, experience, all of those different things. But there's a lot of amazing things that are going on to try to solve this workforce problem. And it comes with a lot of innovation. So this was a great week. I've spent the whole week up here meeting with partners, trying to build some pathways, figuring out what's going on. And I've had more aha if I was this day old before I knew this. And it's been eye-opening. So we look at externships, and we'll, I'll give you one of those examples. Internships and apprenticeships, I'll give you some examples of those. Community outreach and development. We're looking at different things like micro-credentialing. So it shouldn't be that I need a four-year degree. It's like, I need this skill, where can I get it so that I can demonstrate that skill immediately? So an employer can look at it and say, we'll send you to this because we know as soon as you get back, you're gonna be employer, you're gonna be a better employer. And that kind of looks at it, so we have different people in this room. If you're an employer and you're not investing in your workforce, how long before they leave? What's gonna happen? And that's okay, you get turnover, but are we investing? What are we doing? The last thing on here is the diversity issue, diversity, equity, and inclusion. From my experience, and it's hard to say, I'm, I'm a white guy from the Midwest, so I've had opportunity, I get it, I grew up in a very poor rural area, but I don't know the struggles of other people. But what I have seen, is it has become a very inclusive environment. I have never seen a cyber person, if you ask them, that they're not gonna, yeah, what do you wanna know? How can I tell you? I'll share my story. So figure that story out. And the other piece is cyber safety. So we look at it as like, oh, it's cyber security. And I don't necessarily agree with that because we teach kids that put on a helmet before you get in a car. Let's buckle you into your seatbelt. But here, take this phone, don't worry about the bad people that are there. And they just walk away with it like, wait, what's happening? And then the parents ask the question like, where did they learn that? I can't believe that's what they said. What are you doing? And it's not even the content, it's the ads that start getting pushed into it. It's all of these different things that kind of create that environment. So what do we do? I mean, it's always these things. So of course, I get it, gotta talk about the University of Arizona, but only briefly. And it's not because we have the best program, we, we have a program. I'd like to think it's the best, it is one. But what I like about it is the innovation. So education kind of gets a bad rap that it's like theory. No, we're only gonna do this. You gotta open the book that's from 20 years ago, read through it, take this test, good luck, now you're a cybersecurity person. So when we talk about innovation, one of our faculty is Chris Hednagy. So he came to us and he said, well, it was agreement and I'm kind of paraphrasing, but we want you to build a program that you would hire those students as soon as you came out. Okay, that, that's great. He knows what he's talking about. He's a great guy. He's very caring. But the innovation came when we had a company said, we will let your students that have no certifications, no experience, conduct a social engineering test with your guidance on our company. And it went amazing. Students got real world experience. They were able to do these things. That's the innovation that's there. Another thing that's really good is we set up, um, University of Arizona has a SOC, Security Operations Center. So we set up an internship program for our students. Either it's paid internship as a student worker. We also have, hey, I just need some experience. I'll do whatever you tell me. I'll show up 15 hours a week, 20 hours a week. Just tell me what I need to do. Or they can use it for credit. So they have three options. So we've had, I think it's eight now um, over the last couple semesters. They just don't have the ability to take more, or they would. But two of those are now full-time employees. So we, it's kind of like breeding success. We gave them the opportunity. They were the most successful candidates on national searches because they had that experience. They knew what was going on. They were there to protect. Those are some good things. We'll, we'll deal into some of the pathways and partnerships, but I gotta brag on some of our people. So Basha High School, so it's here in Chandler, Arizona. The director of that program said, we're gonna change the world. We are gonna do something new and innovative that nobody else has done before. So they set up to the ninth grade the ability for them to partner with, oh, that was not supposed to happen. Bad slides. Anyways, so let's put Basha back on there and we'll talk. Um, they said they're gonna partner with a community college and that community college is gonna partner with the University of Arizona. So a student, a freshman, will go through this process, shave off time for them, they come through, they get certified, they get hands-on experience. All of these programs were designed to be able to give a pathway, one option, 
but starting much earlier, so they can come out with that. And we're currently working to find out how do we give them experiences, Cyber Patriot, Capture the Flag, National Cyber League, how do we get them that experience coming through and they're in the ninth grade? So that then when they're coming through and they come to the employers that are in the room, they're like, okay, I like that. How can we get involved? I apologize, they're gonna be gone. Chandler Gilbert, another one of those aha moments. Um, so it's all of the Maricopa schools. They will translate certifications into college credits and it's a $40 fee for them to be assessed. That's new-ish. Um, it used to be where you had to pay per credit that you were getting. They're like, it took me 15 minutes to evaluate. Why are we gonna charge people? Reducing the barriers, removing barriers, making sure that people can get through this process. And those credits are transferable to us at the University of Arizona. So that person that said, hey, I didn't choose education for whatever reason, I couldn't afford it, I didn't have the grades, I got into the workforce, I got my certification, I come back to that educational piece to do what needs to happen to take that next level. Maybe I wanna be a manager, maybe I wanna do these things. What is the answer? So it's a pathway. The other thing that's new, I think this was released earlier this year or something like that, apprenticeships. I'm like, I didn't even know cybersecurity had apprenticeships. What are these mythical things? It's like, is that what you do with a plumber and electrician? No, here's some. Unfortunately, there's only one in Arizona. So if you are a company that's willing to develop these programs, they will send you people to go down this path line. Yes, it takes investment. Some of the statistics is, 96% of the people that complete that apprenticeship program are the best employees. They stay with that company. They're engaged with that company. They're, they're harder working, they're more loyal. That's what's coming out of these. And NICE will actually advertise those positions. So it'll be national searches for what's going on. I thought that was pretty interesting. So then we have some great nonprofits and Arizona Cyber Initiative. So they actually got a grant this year um, working with Google and trying to facilitate opportunities down to the high school. But they didn't even say, well, we're gonna stop there. No, they wanna partner with the community college and the four-year institutions and anybody to be the mentors for those high school students. So we're pushing that cyber talent to the left. We're getting it younger, but then we're encouraging the mentorship, the leadership, the skill building as they're going through that stuff. That's pretty powerful. So I had to put a big plug, Manny Felix, so if you need information, but there's three different options. The uh, one on the left, if you scan that, if you're a high school student, I don't, you might not have anybody, but if you have a kid that's a high school student, scan this, have them sign up. It's a paid opportunity for some of these things. Um, and I'll talk about another one there too. The instructors, they receive a stipend. Um, and then if you want to sponsor, feel free. So it's a plug for the organization. They're amazing, they're passionate, they travel all over the, or all over the state trying to develop opportunities. Um, so they have a, I'm not gonna remember the word, so I'll just leave it at that. Awesome organization. This is just one. These are the people that I know. And like I said, over the last couple of weeks, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's another thing. There's another slide. How do I add all these things? There's so many great things that are happening, so many good initiatives. And then Pima Community College. So we heard Mary about ego, right? So two years ago, Pima Community College said, we're, we're gonna change the world again. We're gonna look at what this is. And you see the picture at the top left, that's, they built a sock. Like, Screens all over the place, computers, and students work with that. They are part of the Arizona Cyber Warfare range, which is where you get that ego piece. So not only are they looking for students, so the first time they gave me a tour of this, they're like, leave your ego at the door. I'm like, I, I don't get it. But people do have an ego. It's about learning, it's about collaborating, it's about networking. But it wasn't just for the students. Um, I, I, I will mess up that person's name, so I'm not even gonna try. I think she was 60, 65 years old. She was one of the mentors. She's like, I know nothing about this, but I like being here because I'm learning. Um, and I could be wrong with the age, but it was in inspiring to see somebody that's like, I don't need to be a cyber professional, but I like what's happening and I like being here to help. So that's kind of impressive. Well, how are we building this um, ability? How are we building these skills that these are working on it? And they're working with data. They're securing the state of Arizona while they're doing this and they're teaching the next generation of cyber professionals. And that's just a few of the great things that they're doing. Phoenix Chamber of Commerce. So I was pretty excited to work with non-fam. She's like, hey, we're gonna pay people to come here to learn about this. This is a great partnership with organizations, industry, they actually pay, they put a stipend in so that students get money to come learn about cyber. Um, it starts at 16, I think they'll take younger, but um, looking to connect people, to get that advocacy out, to find those champions to be able to move this mission forward. 
So it comes up with a pathway. Actually, it looks pretty good up there. Um, so a pathway is one option, but we need to figure out how do we change it. And it was funny because I was standing in the back and kind of listening to people talk, and while I've been at this conference, like, I just need people to have a couple of skills. They're really good at it. They have some passion. They can do it. Okay, but how do we create that? How do we create that opportunity? How do we figure out what's going on? So this overlay is just following regular grade school. But how do we introduce that cyber safety as soon as we hand them some technology? And sometimes we're not handing them technology. Um, when my daughter was about to be born, I was in, um, I think, Babies R Us. I think it was still open at that time. Probably not so much anymore. But it was like, push a button, and the stroller would like collapse. I'm like, what are we doing? And it would like move on its own. It had a remote control. I'm like, OK, that's kind of weird. And that was eight years ago, so that was not really, I mean, IoT was there, but really, what are we doing? And how many baby monitors are connected to the internet? How many people have some kind of voice-activated assistant that's sitting in the bedroom of that kid? Um, I woke up one morning, and the heat was on. I'm like, what is going on? My young daughter came and said, oh, it's cold. So I told Google to turn up the heat. I'm like, <laughs> wait, OK, we, we need to fix this. What, what is going on? But it was that aha moment again. She gave me many. Um, but it was very strange to see what's going on. So how do we link these opportunities together? How do we give them on-the-job experience? Who here is a business owner? Who, who does hiring if you're not a business owner? Anybody? OK, so we got a few hands in the room. Would you hire a 16-year-old to come work in your sock or do work for you in a security? A lot of head shaking, like, oh, no, I don't know what you're talking about, but that's a security risk. Would you hire an 18-year-old? OK, people would, OK? Talk to me afterwards. I, we got some people that we can uh, kind of push down your path there. But that's important. How do we do that? How do we change that paradigm? What opportunities can we give them to simulate the work experience for them to be able to do the things that they need to do? We often hear, like, I just can't find good enough people to work for me. It's like, OK, well, what chances are you taking? What innovations are you doing? How are you changing the paradigm to get people out there to do what they need to do? So the other piece that this doesn't really talk about, though, is a slightly different factor. It shows that seamless progression, and I use that BASHA community college to four-year institution model as this. But it doesn't say the 18-year-old high school student that says, I'm going to go join the military, and then I'm going to come back. I'm going to go do this path, and then I'm going to come back. Well, the problem with that is, and I experienced this, is I took all of these steps. I'm like, well, I want to go do that program. They're like, ah, see, you need these prerequisites. you got to do this. And I'm like, OK. So I shuffled over to the community college, and I'm taking my first C class. And I take my second one. They're like, ah, see, but you can't get there because you didn't do this. Now you need to go back and take this math. Paul does not do math. Calculus is not my friend. So I, it, it stopped that progression. They said no. They didn't say, well, what if we can do this? I was emailing instructors because, like, can I get a waiver? You said I have to take these other eight classes. Can I? They were like, ah, sure, come on in. I'm like, OK, but if Paul can do it, why can't everybody else? And it really looks at what is happening. So we need to find a way to yes. And it, I get it. You're, you don't want to say yes to everybody, but they should have options. They should have the ability to navigate this system to figure out where they're going. So what does the future look like? So. I'll talk about education. We talk about cyber professionals, and we can't hire people. There's 500,000 jobs, right? Are we paying them enough? OK, we heard Mary say, mm, what's the industry standard? Now, try putting a cyber professional into an elementary school. Try putting a cyber professional into a high school. You're going to have somebody with degrees, uh, certifications, and say, I'm going to pay you $35,000 a year, but we really need you. No, that's not going to work. And there's some very passionate people that will do that. But is that the norm? No. I mean, we have people like, um, a lot of our students look at it like, well, they said it's a $100,000 a year job. Maybe. But where? Well, in LA, in San Francisco, in DC. It's like, OK, so you're making about $15 an hour. Let, let's face it, it's really expensive to live there. And they don't see that. They see the dollar sign that comes in their pocket. So the Cyber Innovation Fund, I met with a couple of partners to try to figure out a way where we can centralize some of those resources so we can pay those teachers a better wage to still be able to complete the mission. Um, Raytheon, Intel, a lot of companies are focusing on, you need to give back. You need to go sponsor, mentor, do something, and teach, or whatever the thing is. But what if we could bring all of these people together and be synergistic? We could solve these problems. We could figure out what's going on. And I get it. 
at a certain point in people's life, time and money. It's like, my Girl Scout, Girl Scout cookies? Anybody? Anybody? I, okay. Let me know. I'll get you the link, and you can buy some Girl Scout cookies. But it's not really that. It's so, okay, so I got to spend eight hours at a booth this weekend. Uh, can I just write you a check for $100? What are we doing here? Um, so I get it. It's time, money, effort. How are we going to give back to our community? How are we going to bring up that next generation of cyber professionals? What are we going to do? It's not Paul. It's not all of you sitting in the room. Everybody has a stake in this, and everybody has some responsibility if we want to do that. So we need to collaborate. We need pathways. Reducing barriers. Um, I was out on the East Coast working with a foundation, and they're like, we give these eight certification boot camps for free. We don't charge anybody. They sign up. We give it to them for free. We're reducing the barriers because where they were lo located in the Quantico region, all of those companies needed those basic certifications, all the way up to CISSP. I was like, oh, that's pretty impressive. That's good stuff. And they have an amazing lab where they do summer camps. They try to do this STEM education. They're changing the paradigm. They're changing the narrative to change the needle of what this is. Certifications, I, they're a necessary evil at this point. Um, and it really depends. But we already talked about. Mm -hmm. There's too many, and what are the important ones? And do, do people even know what they are? Like, if the HR person says, I, CISSP, does HR know what CISSP is? Probably not. So who is the technology person that said, hey, I need this IT, this security person, and just put a job ad out? You, you need to articulate what it is. What are you looking for? What are those skills so that people can get there? Stackable certs, but cyber is a life skill, like finances. and which isn't really taught a whole lot either. But we need to figure out how do we integrate this threat of cyber, the cyber safety, into everybody's life so that people see it as a skill, as an opportunity, as a way to thrive. We do a lot of work with the borderland community. I, I grew up in rural uh, Midwest. There was no tech path. That just didn't exist for me. So how do we get those people to understand that it, not only is it there, it's an option. It's achievable for them. So we have to get out there and be advocates. So this is um, last slide, and I'm way ahead of schedule, but that's OK, because I'll open it up to questions. But if you're an applicant and you're looking for this, you have a responsibility. This isn't like, I took this degree, or I got Security Plus, which means you will give me a job. It doesn't work that way. If you're an applicant, uh, Mary said it too, you have to put in the work. You have to go through that process. It is not going to be handed to you. And that certification is not going to do you any good when they sit you down in their interview and they say, describe your home network to me. Well, Cox came in, and they hooked it up, and gave me my password, and now we're good to go. It's like, no, 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 what, but did you set up a guest network? How did you secure it? What are you doing? What, what are the things that are associated with it? I don't, I don't know. Oh, OK. So describe this. How does like SSL, TLS, just basic questions. How does this work? Um, I know it secures the traffic. Is that what you're looking for? So you need to own it. Um, and that's just the skills. But you also own your journey. I took advantage of the opportunities as they came along. If I would have said stranger danger and walked away from that individual in the parking lot, okay, yes, I did trust them. And please, if it is a stranger danger, please walk away. Um, but I wouldn't have even realized it. I was open to any opportunity that came my way. I talked about vetsec.org. I've seen so much training come through that Slack channel. And I asked the director, and I said, hey, how many people took advantage? How many people signed up? One, I, I have slots that I can't even fill. But yet, if you look at the other channel for education and certifications, like, how do I get this opportunity? What do I need to do? How do I get there? But they don't take advantage of those opportunities. Asking for help. This is humbling. I get it. Going out and saying, I don't know something. And I come from the world of academia, where PhDs are flourishing all over the place, and they are the experts in their field. And you ask them a question, well, you know, I'm really focused on this piece. Okay, but this was the question. I'm like, is this a politician? What am I doing here? I need an answer to this. You said you taught these eight classes. How do you do this thing? Well, you know, I'm really focused on this. OK. Ask for help. People are willing to mentor. People are willing to be there for you. If you're an organization, time. I get it. Time, money, whatever it is. If you have a cause or you work for a company, find out a way to give back to some of these organizations, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's a school district. We have school districts that are trying to do cybersecurity all over the state where they don't have laptops. They don't have computers. So how many life cycles go through your organizations where you just dump this stuff off at some kind of a repo, and it just goes to waste? Figure out a way to turn it into a school district, 
get some tax advantage off of it, but then you give the resources to somebody else to be able to do something. Financial support, it's always easy. Well, depending on the company, it's nice to be able to write a check. Um, I talked about a recent thing. I don't know if it, uh, I follow the academic news, but Dakota State University, middle of nowhere, South Dakota, just received $90 million. I think it was 50 million of that was from a single donor. Like, hey, we need to change cybersecurity in this state. They developed a cyber, um, governor's cyber academy for K through 12 education, focusing on it. They realize what the problem is. They're taking steps to be able to do that. Why can't we do that in Arizona? Why can't we change the way that things are being done? And then jobs and internships. Um, I get it takes a lot of time to train and mentor. In my experience, 80% of my time was dealing with the 5% of the population that were just a hassle. It's like the kid that didn't know what they needed to do, they're always getting in trouble. I gotta go to jail to pick this person up. What is happening? But treating those people as humans, as individuals, to make sure that they were successful. You don't treat them differently because they didn't make good decisions. Did they know how to make good decisions? Did they know how to get there? So what are you gonna do to be able to give that job? So we have students that are graduating. I'm not saying all students are created equal, I get it, but they want an opportunity. If you have an opportunity, let's connect. Let's try to do that. That's not just Paul, the University of Arizona. ASU, same thing. They graduate people multiple times a year. The high school student that's coming out, how do we give them an opportunity? Whether it's showing them a way, sponsoring a summer camp. Maybe that's equipment so that we can do that thing. We have plenty of passionate people that are willing to do so many things for that. And then if you're a professional, Share your experience, share your journey. It's one thing where I am confident that if we ask everybody in this room, what was your journey to cybersecurity? It's a completely different journey for every single one of us. It is a different way for us to be able to get to where we are today. And that's not the end of the journey. It's some point along that journey. So how do we help them? And I'm not saying that this, the person that asked you that, that that's the roadmap, that's the blueprint, that's the DNA. No, that is one option. So you can start to connect with those individuals and their stories and maybe say, that really aligns with where I'm at. That, that, that speaks to who I am. How do I figure out? It connects them with that possibility. It allows them to go and to go share. So with that, I think that's it. So does anybody have any questions? And if not, you are out of here early to go enjoy your evening. Absolutely. So, team, how, do, how does that work? Okay, yeah, email me. Absolutely. And so at the end of these, and so here. Yep, so I added a bunch of different things in here. I didn't want to go over all of them. Um, they kind of align with what I think people should do or like reach out. And it's one of very few opportunities that are actually listed there. So I got cards too if you want those. But yeah, please reach out, connect. Paul is not the end all be all. The University of Arizona is not the end all be all. If I don't know somebody, but I know somebody, I will connect you in a heartbeat to say, hey, you need to go talk to Bob over here or this person over there. It's about connecting, making opportunities, but it's for students, it's for the Arizona, it's for security. Do you know how handsome the uh, cybersecurity Yeah, so that's a good question. So I will speak for the University of Arizona. So our program is actually a two-year program. So we don't get freshmen and sophomore. Um, it's just kind of a unique way for our college. Right now, we graduate about 150 students a semester-ish, give or take, depending. Uh, winter graduation is less than spring. Um, right now, we just got a grant for workforce development to increase that. Uh, the state says we should be at 2,000 students within the next couple of years, and we need to graduate. But it's that two-year piece. So that's the goal. So that's just one school of the statistics for, um, I brought up like that National Center of Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity, that NSA FBI funded thing. Um, there's 24 that hold the cyber operations designation. It's the engineers, exploit writer kind of folks, uh, very computer science heavy. And then there's, I think, 350, 400 of schools that are designated otherwise. But they're putting these people out, but then it gets back to the question of, do they have the right skills? What are they coming out with? And that's where that industry partnership is important. You need to tell us as educators what is important to you. And we can't change curriculum overnight. You'd think we could, but it doesn't work that way. There's a lot of approvals. 
but we are willing to add a class in, a certificate, a certification, whatever we need to do to meet the needs of industry, and community colleges are much better at it than, than four-year institutions. So um, that's what we do. So multiply that by, I don't know, 400, and we're, we're pushing out a lot of talent. Other questions? All right, thank you all for your time. Have a great night, have a great weekend. Almost made it. What's up? <laughs> is that, uh, what advice can you give your students during the hiring process, interview prep, conversation notes, negotiation, red flags? Great. So, I, and I love that question. So, it kind of